Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you at the Institute of Politics at the Intermarium Lecture Series. Today, our speaker is Mr. Viktor Venglevich, who is a PhD candidate at the Jagiellonian uh, University uh, and the recipient of the grant Etuda 6 for research uh, from the Polish National Science Center. And a part of this grant allowed him to uh, conduct his research at uh, Harvard uh, University. So, Mr. Venglevich uh, came to speak for us, especially from Boston. Um, he will be talking about the three cases of Polish captivity in the years 1918-1924 in line with his research interests uh, which uh, um, concern Europe uh, during the Great War and shortly afterwards. This is a little researched period of history uh, and his findings uh, are an invaluable contribution to our knowledge uh, about the period of um, border forming of Poland after and the Great War. Uh, Mr. Reylewicz, welcome. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for coming. And today I would like to present a topic which is hardly known uh, in world historiography as, uh, and has yet to be well developed. The question of prisoners of wars and internees in Poland uh, between 1918 and 1924. Um, I, um, maybe at first I will explain the title because uh, I thought that uh, it could be misleading. So I will uh, speak about not Polish people in the, the other countries, uh, in the camps of uh, in Ukraine or um, Soviet camps, but uh, two groups of Ukrainians as well as Bolsheviks in the Polish camps. So, um, as I said, I will focus my study on three groups who were from three different countries. Um, two of them were Ukrainians from Ukrainian People Republic, so eastern part of, uh, central and eastern part of Ukraine, and uh, Western Ukrainian People's Republic. Uh, the first group uh, were um, prisoners from Soviet Russia. So uh, before I start, I will um, I would like to say a few words about uh, the political and military situation uh, in the Central and Eastern Europe in 1917-1918 to shed some light um, on the background of the issues I will explain. Um, so who were these prisoners of war and uh, how did they end up in the Polish capital? So uh, let's move to Petrograd in 1970. On November 7th, a group of Bolsheviks led by Vladimir Lenin took over control of the capital city um, through the coup data, later named um, October Revolution, and started taking control um, over the central Russian governorates, as you can see the map of central Russia. Uh, meanwhile, in Kyiv, the Ukrainian Central uh, Council, a uh, quasi-Ukrainian parliament, uh, decided to proclaim independence of this country. Thus, the Ukrainian People's Republic uh, was established on November 20, 1917, but through so-called Dnipro Ukraine, chaos was spreading, uh, caused by uh, peasants' anti-landlord movement, as well as Bolshevik invasion in January 1918. Uh, after the brest litovsk Treaty on February 9, 1918, the Germans and Austrians' uh, armies uh, entered Ukrainian territory and uh, saved the state from the Soviet control. Uh, yet, these new arrivals decided to organize coup uh, on their own in April 1980 uh, and change the form um, the country to the so-called Hetmana, led by the former um, uh, Tsarist General Pavel Skoropatsky. And thus, uh, this country, this new Ukrainian country was established. Uh, in November 1918, during the German retreat, Ukrainian socialists, among them uh, the most important were Volodymyr Venechenko and Simon Petura, um, organized an uprising and regained independence from the Germans and um, Skoropatsky's armies. But immediately after uh, the wars against Poland uh, in the West and Soviet Russia, uh, Soviet Russia on the east broke out. So, from January until May 1919, the Poles captured Volhynia territory, so this is the 
uh, Western territory of um, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, many of UPR soldiers were taken prisoners and placed in Polish captivity. Yet they were not exactly enemies for long because one year uh, later, on April 21st, 1920, the Polish Ukrainian Treaty, known as uh, Piłsudski Petlura Pact, was signed. Now, Ukrainian soldiers were treated as Polish allies, and together they launched uh, the Kyiv offensive. After the Polish Soviet armistice in October 1920, Ukrainians continued to fight but were forced to cross the border uh, with Poland and ended up as internees in the Polish camp. Um, another situation was in so-called Galicia region. Uh, before 1914, uh, it was part of Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, the province was divided, as we can see on the map, into two parts. Um, so Western, where Poles uh, were majority, and Eastern, with Ukrainians as a biggest national group. Uh, in November 1918, during the collapse of the Habsburg Empire, Ukrainians proclaimed independence and established so-called Western Ukrainians People Republic with Lviv as a capital. Uh, of course, uh, Polis couldn't reconcile with this city, considered a center for the Polish uh, culture and uh, higher education and so on. So, um, Polish-Ukrainian war erupted and uh, lasted until July 1990, when the last troops of Ukrainian Halic army crossed the former Russian Austrian border. Um, the part of army uh, was also disarmed by Poles one year later during the Kyiv Offensive uh, in April 1920. And the last group, so Red Army men, um, uh -huh, this is the map of West Ukrainian People's Republic. So the last group was Red Army men. Um, as we know, the Polish Soviet War began in February 1919 when Bolsheviks. Um, uh, unit appeared in Belarus and uh, lasted until October 1920 and eventually came on March 18, 1920 with the uh, uh, Riga Peace Treaty was signed. As a result of this war, uh, some 180,000 Red Army men ended up in the Polish captivity. So these are the two, three groups. Okay, uh, let's move to the next point. Um, mm -hmm. Since we already know who was in the Polish captivity after 1918, the next question uh, to consider is uh, what was the attitude of uh, Polish authorities towards them? Uh, maybe it's a truism, but um, it was not the same and uh, even varied uh, at different times. Uh, based on my research, I can say that uh, uh, Eastern Ukrainians were um, in the best situation, especially after November 1920. Uh, for most of the time, they had been treated as either allies or neutral volunteers of foreign nationality. Uh, thus, compared to the others, uh, they had been treated better than by the Polish army. Uh, for example, no violence and better alimentation. It's necessary to mention that on September 1st, 1919, a Polish East Ukrainian armistice was signed, through which the status of POVs was changed from enemies to neutrals. And subsequent uh, treaty from December, maybe I will uh, show the information. Um, so uh, the treaty from December 2nd, 1919, uh, stay, uh, stipulated that. UPR's government um, could form two infantry divisions from the people who were sitting in the camps. And um, also in spring and summer 1920, uh, after the already mentioned piłsudski patlura Pact, alliance has been signed, the Polish side tried to uh, support uh, the Ukrainian army by uh, allowing them to use volunteers from those people from the former Red Army and as well as White Army uh, Rose, uh, who were sitting in the camps. So, um, as a result, a few thousand uh, people uh, joined the Ukrainian army. And it was a quite big reinforcement. So, also in 1920, so just after the Riga peace has been signed, 
um, Polish Ministry of Military Affairs secretly supported internet Ukrainian military units. Uh, they organized so-called the Second Winter March in October 1912. So, uh, the situation, uh, this positive situation changed in uh, autumn of 1921 when control over the camps was transferred from uh, military um, authorities to civilian and uh, unfortunately they tried to reduce the number of the people in the camps because of, because of the cost, mostly because of the cost. And uh, also in 1920, uh, 1922, the government in Poland changed, and they were not as uh, friendly to Ukrainians as the previous ones were. So uh, the Polish government began decreasing the, their number, uh, leading to the closure of the less camps uh, of Strakow and Kalish in 1924. So, the situation with Galician Ukrainians was uh, a bit different. Um, so, throughout the internment, they were treated as a dangerous enemies uh, for the young Polish state. And uh, this was also um, one of the reasons why uh, Polish authorities interned so many civilians. So, on February 1st, uh, 1919, um, there was signed a uh, Polish-Ukrainian uh, agreement uh, concerning treatment of prisoners of war, internees and wounded in Lviv. So, by virtue of its provisions, uh, the cost of maintaining all internees lay on the side of where the camps were found. So, uh, Polish people were responsible for maintaining Ukrainians in the Polish captivity and the Ukrainians were responsible for uh, the Polish person in Western Ukrainian camps. So, uh, for example, and, uh, and these provisions were uh, very good because, uh, as an example, officers got uh, 500 crown, Austrian crowns uh, per month, and it was a quite big amount of money to maintain themselves. And uh, also, uh, uh, there was a possibility to send letters to the families or conducting a religious service in the camps. Oh, okay. So, um, but uh, the number of the uh, people from Eastern Galicia was very big, uh, over 30,000. So, uh, in at the winter of 1919, um, Polish uh, Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs decided to to release the, the civilians, the Ukrainian civilians as well as Jews from the camps. And uh, officers and soldiers of Ukrainian Halish army um, were released a few months later. So they got uh, a leave from the camps in April 1920. And finally, the Bolsheviks. For all the time, they were treated as an enemy POVs, and no agreement between Poland and Soviet Russia was signed. So, however, it is worth to note that. Some of them joined to the third Russian army, which was the part of um, General Petr Wrangel volunteer army, and it was formed in Poland um, uh, during the crucial months of Polish survival in 1920. So, uh, so some of them, ex Red Army men, joined to the White Russians and were fighting together with Poles and Ukrainians. And only on February 24th. 1921 was uh, an exchange agreement between Poland and Soviet Russia signed. So according to these provisions, uh, all Red Army men should be exchanged for Polish POVs and internees in Soviet Russia. So only a small part remained in Poland. So and uh, here we can see the one picture uh, with uh, the Simon Petlura during uh, his visit in the camp of Vadovice in April uh, 1921. Uh, also, um, here we can see the, uh, some, some photographs from the, uh, some pictures from the camps of, uh, in the dress, dress, breastplate of ski. Uh, there were uh, three camps inside this fortress and uh, at the, at the first picture we can see the line of the Bolsheviks uh, 
for the loss of words, to the, probably to the kitchen. And uh, on the right picture, we can see the probably Eastern Ukrainian officers in this fortress. There was a separate camp for of only for officers. Uh, also, uh, here we can see some types of uh, Bolsheviks, how they, they looked like in 100 years ago. Then, uh, let's move to next point. So, uh, now I would like to give some words about alimentation of POVs and injuries. So, um, in general, there was uh, two tables, uh, so-called tables of alimentation. So, C and E. The more important was the, the, the table E. Um, so, uh, it was used for everyone in the camp who weren't working. So, for the vast majority of them. Uh, the daily food ration um, consisted of 500 grams of bread, 150 grams of meat, 500 grams of potatoes, and some other products like vegetables and species. So the second one, the table C, was used for those prisoners uh, who were used as a workforce um, and uh, it provides a larger portion of uh, bread and potatoes. So um, theoretically, uh, this amount of food guaranteed by the Polish state was enough to survive in the camp. But in fact, the situation was slightly different. Uh, it must be mentioned uh, that uh, lack of large-scale food production possibilities uh, due to the destruction of World War I. Uh, it should be mentioned that about 90% of territory of Second Polish Republic uh, experienced the effects of combat operations during the, the First World War, so, so the country was completely destroyed. So um, the Polish state couldn't supply its own army, its own citizens, uh, civilian population, so uh, they couldn't also maintain uh, so big group of prisoners of war in the camps. So, uh, how, uh, what did this look like in practice? So, first of all, the food rations were insufficient in situation where there was not enough heat in barracks because they, they were very cold. There wasn't also um, coal and wood for eating. So, uh, and also epidemi epidemical diseases spread in the cats. So, uh, moreover, the quality of the food was often bad. For example, uh, meat was not always fresh or potatoes were frozen. So, um, and thirdly, during the um, summer of 1919, uh, there was a lack of bread, even though the 1919 harvest was also rather good. So instead of bread, uh, the Polish army gave uh, some American crackers. Uh, they were bought by Polish government uh, in France from supplies of American uh, expedition corps. So in 1920, the situation was even worse because after the Warsaw and Niemann battle, um, roughly 180,000 Soviet Red Army men were captured, so feeding such a large a number of people exceeded the possibilities of Polish state. So, uh, in general, um, they were starving. Uh, and only after uh, releasing um, Ukrainians and departing of Soviet POVs, the situation changed to, to be better. And, uh, but also, it, it was uh, at least fair in, for the Eastern Ukrainians. So, um, uh, the best situation was, however, for uh, Ukrainians from Eastern Galicia, because they had so-called Ukrainian Civic Committee uh, established in Lviv in December 1980, uh, which from July of next year uh, was sending food directly to the camps. Uh, also, there were uh, a lot of local Ukrainian charity organizations, uh, among them Samaritan Helping Tremors, uh, um, who had a lot for these people. So, for example, in Tremish, the Ukrainian women were cooking um, dinners every day for uh, the prisoners in the camp of Pikulice for, for, for a month, I think. So, um, 
also uh, Galician Ukrainians had the possibility to get some food from their families. Okay, so one of the biggest problem among the prisoners and internees was disease illnesses. Were uh, needless to say that uh, sanitary situation throughout this time inside the camp was difficult. So um, the difference was only during the, the first month, so from the end of the 1990 until uh, the, the summer of 1990, when uh, there, there weren't so many people in the camps. Uh, so since July 1990, the epidemical diseases were a constant companion for all these prisoners of wars and injuries. There were a few types of them, so perhaps the most widespread was typhus. Uh, and uh, we can see one of the uh, Bolshevik prisoners who suffered from this disease. And um, also there was a lot of uh, people who suffered from dysentery and pneumonia. Uh, it, it is also necessary to know that uh, it's necessary to know that hygiene awareness in the Red Army uh, was very low and uh, they often came to the camps already infected uh, with which only provide diseases to spread more easily among such a large uh, enclosed concentration of people. So um, Ukrainians as a more educated people uh, try their best to maintain a good level of hygiene and thanks to that they could avoid the epidemic uh, epidemics during their stay of the camps. Uh, although many of Galician Ukrainians died during um, their stay in the camps and we uh, can see the, the list of uh, died um, uh, soldiers from Ukrainian Galician army in the first months of 1920 of this picture. And uh, at the end I would like to say something about culture and spiritual life because uh, it was quite well developed, uh, especially among Ukrainians. So, um, we know quite a lot of, about it and from the sources is, the sources is evident that the most active in this field were Eastern Ukrainians. Uh, also Galicians uh, had a very well developed cultural life but limited only to some camps. Uh, whereas Bolsheviks hardly had either cultural or spiritual life. The reasons for this is uh, simple. Uh, Petlura's forces were living in the camps after Polish-Soviet armistice, so they had a lot of time to develop um, good cultural life. Also, a lot of people with higher education uh, were among them. Uh, so, also among internal Galicians there were a lot of intelligentsia who immediately after the detention started organizing various forms of cultural life behind the Verbet War. And Bolsheviks, um, the Red Army consisted mainly of peasants, so they, they were, the um, vast majority of them were illiterate, so they, they couldn't develop a uh, good cultural life. So, uh, here uh, on this picture we can see um, some forms of cultural life. There was um, uh, very, very, various kinds of them. So, um, um, at first, uh, I can mention various kinds of schools. Uh, in the camp of Dombia, um, the, uh, there was organized primary school for those who didn't have any uh, formal education or stop attending the schools because of war. Also, uh, there, there were higher academical courses uh, in this camp, thank to present uh, many people uh, with PhD degrees, like a uh, professor of uh, Ukrainian literature from the Lviv University, uh, Kirill Stujinsky, or um, uh, lawyer Volodymyr Starosolsky, or uh, the other lawyer uh, Volodymyr Zahakiev. So they organized a lot of this. Uh, courses. Uh, the other group of intelligence are created so-called literature science circles where uh, they were writing a poetry and issued handwriting written 
newspaper called This is Dobre. So uh, here we can see a few examples of them, and um, this newspaper is on the top, on the right. Uh, so um, also in this camp, a mixed choir of POVs were established. Uh, it took part in many events, like uh, especially during Greek Catholic masses on Sunday and concerts organized from time to time when the camp command was in good mood, as uh, Kirill Stuzinski wrote in his memoirs from the captivity. So, um, also, uh, okay, uh, what concerns Eastern Ukrainians, they were issuing a lot of, really a lot of uh, newspapers. Um, so the, num uh, the known number of them exceeds 70. Um, there were various genres, so from dailies like uh, Nova Jutia, it's shown here, New Life, uh, to um, uh, the wikis, and uh, um, also the other one. So, uh, the topics were uh, varied from general information politics to cultural activities to highly specialized materials like sport, military, and histo historical. So the other fields of uh, Ukrainian cultural activity after 1920 were um, theater and music was, uh, were impressive because since 1921 dozens of plays and concerts were performed, not only for the camps and inhabitants but also uh, for the Polish citizens of surrounding cities like uh, Poznan or Toro. And last but not least, the cultural activity should be also added collecting war memoirs by veterans and establishing the Chernobyl Publishing House in 1923. And as I said, Bolsheviks uh, hardly had any cultural life. Um, we can find only a few examples of them such as attempt to celebrate the third anniversary of October Revolution in the camp of Vadovice at the end of the October 1920, or uh, my first worker day feast in Don. So, uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yes. Question. Uh, are, it, are there any lists of POWs um, online available uh, on the internet? Uh, Unfortunately, not. Um, it should be done because, uh, um, from my researches, it turns out that uh, the number of uh, Galician Ukrainian POWs uh, in Polish captivity was about 45,000, so, mm -hmm. so it was quite a large group. And also, a lot of them died. Mm -hmm. Maybe not a lot, a lot of them, but about 10% of them died. So it should be done. Where are these lists now? In what archives uh, can you find them? And that, that's a problem, you know, ah. because uh, some lists survived in the archives, mainly in Lviv. But, um, uh, Polish uh, Ministry of uh, Military Affairs in 1919 created the, um, in the for department um, the section uh, which collected the information about uh, prisoners of war from each camp. So um, the list of the prisoners were sent to Warsaw. Uh, so in uh, in theory they should. Uh, they should be in the Warsaw Archives, but probably it was destroyed during the Second World War. Uh, I haven't found this. So, unfortunately, we don't have um, uh, lists of the prisoners, and I think uh, it won't be possible to, to, to create a um, complete list of the all prisoners who passed through the Polish country. So, where do you take your materials mostly? Where did you find it? In uh, archives. So, um, yes. Basically, um, in uh, Warsaw archives, so archives of modern records, and uh, Central Military Archive in Warsaw. So, it's the biggest uh, Warsaw where the materials after the Polish army uh, are stored. 
and also in Lviv. So the two main archives, uh, so it's a central uh, state historical archive of Ukraine uh, and uh, the archive of the Lviv Oblast. So also, of course, in Kyiv, uh, there is a central state archive of supreme bodies of power and administration where the, um, there is a lot of materials after the uh, UPR's army stored. It's a huge amount of documents. It's a lot. So, so uh, yeah. So it's about I used materials from twelve or thirteen archives as well as libraries in Poland, Ukraine, and uh, Czech Republic and uh, United States. And so here you can find. <coughs> Why did you get interested in this topic? Oh. So, um, I um, wrote a master thesis about Camp of Dawn. So, I've chosen this topic because it uh, hadn't been developed uh, in the time when I interested in it. So, uh, and then I moved to the topic of Galician Ukrainians in Polish captivity because uh, my PhD uh, focused on this part of prisoners. And uh, I realized that uh, there is a big necessity of um, developing the, this topic because it's important in Polish Ukrainian relationship. And uh, no one wrote about it. So, so yes, I decided to, to, to carry uh, the research on this. And also because I'm just interested in, uh, in Polish-Ukrainian war and Polish-Soviet war. So. Well, I, I figure there is a lot of interest in the Second World War, but the First World War still remains kind of um, a void in our national identity. So, thank you for doing this. Are there any more questions? I'm guessing you have to speak Ukrainian and Russian. I'm sorry? Have to probably speak Ukrainian yes. and Russian. Yes. So, do you have any background? Like your family is from no. Ukraine? Uh, no. Mm. Just wondering. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I'm Polish, so I don't have any Ukrainian or Russian words. Okay, so once again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Vinglevich. Thank you very much.